Good morning. Today we're going to be in Exodus chapter 15. If you want to turn with me and follow along in your Bibles, we'll be in Exodus chapter 15. You know, I've spoken many times about how much I enjoyed my time at uh, Gulf Coast Bible College uh, during those years, but one thing that became painfully clear as I actually began to serve in ministry on a church staff is that no amount of classroom instruction or teaching can prepare you for real-life ministry. You know, I've been in ministry for just over 40 years, and during that time, I've met a lot of people. I've talked to a lot of people, many of whom are going through some of the toughest days of their lives. I've been there for illness, for injury, for sorrow, and for grief. But I've also been there for some of those spiritual struggles as well. And it strikes me that most folks are in need of one of three types of healing, and sometimes even more than just one of the three. They certainly need physical healing. They may well need emotional healing because they are uh, sad or they are afraid. And I'm assuming that all of us need some spiritual healing as well. Perhaps you're dealing with a physical frailty right now, and you are just exhausted emotionally. Or your past hurts are still causing present pain. And there's a good chance that you've slipped spiritually at some point in your life. You know, one of my roles as pastor is to pray with folks when they are broken physically, emotionally, or spiritually. And if we were to add up the amount of agony and pain represented in our, even our own congregation, it would literally take our breath away. This morning, our focus is on yet another name for God. We're going to be looking at the name Jehovah Rapha, or the Lord, our healer. Now, this name is first revealed shortly after the Israelites were unshackled from their bondage in Egypt. They've just passed through the Red Sea on dry ground. The people are excited to finally be free, and so they express their praise in the first part of Exodus chapter 15. We read in verse 1, Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Now, God is referred to by two of his names in that passage, Elohim and Yahweh. And so uh, it, it, you can read the whole passage. It goes on for 21 verses. But then their amazing praising turns into a time of protesting. In verse 22, we read that Moses led them into the desert of Shur. Now, Shur means wall, and that's exactly how they felt. They had run into a wall of despair instead of a window to blessing. Some of you watching me this morning, you feel like you've hit a wall. After wandering in the wilderness for three days, having no water to drink, the people turn on Moses at a place called Mara, which means bitterness. By the way, this is the same name that if you go to the book of Ruth, uh, we see that Mara is the name that Naomi chose for herself 
after experiencing incredible pain and disappointment there in the first chapter of Ruth. Well, God's people go from giving praise to grumbling because their protest, you know, when they finally find some water, they discover that the water had a very bitter taste. I mean, talk about disappointment. They were probably extremely excited to locate this refreshment, only to have their expectations shattered. In verse 24, they put Moses on the spot, and they said, What are we going to drink? And the people are angry with God, but they take it out on a person. We do that as well too, don't we? Someone has said that anger is a magnet in search of metal, and the closest metal was Moses. We tend to take things out on others when we don't get what we want when we want it. I mean, we're pumped up when everything seems great, but then there's that inevitable letdown. You're riding high, and then comes the break to, you know, you got to come back down to reality as we head into some deep and bitter waters. Well, the Israelites saw God provide in making a way through the Red Sea, but now they're thirsty. And on top of that, now they have a bitter taste in their mouth. Some of you may feel that way this morning. You've gone from high expectations to great disappointment, to heavy discouragement. But I want you to notice that their gratitude turns to griping when the memory of God's faithfulness is somehow forgotten. And it only took them three days to land in the ditch of despair. We see that bitterness can blind us to the promises of God. They had forgotten what life in Egypt was, you know, it was terrible. Even though they ate bitter herbs as part of the Passover to remember the bitterness of slavery. But now, freedom from Egypt has also left them feeling bitter because their expectations are shattered. And Moses does what he should do, and he cries out to the Lord. Instead of protesting, he prays. That's what hard times can do for us. When we're in pain, we need to pray. God answers Moses by showing him a simple piece of wood. And Moses takes the wood and he whips it into the water and the water immediately becomes sweet. God then initiates a test and tells him in verse 26, This is Exodus chapter 15, verse 26. If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Now I want you to notice God is linking their holiness with their health as he declares one more name for himself, Jehovah Rapha. And in the midst of their bitterness and their hurt, God reveals himself as their healer. He says, for I am the Lord who heals you. The word Rapha is used some 60 times in the Old Testament, and it means to restore, to heal, or to cure. And that can stand for physically, emotionally, and spiritually. In 1 Kings chapter 18, we get a picture of what Rapha means when we read that Elijah repaired, or Rapha, the altar of Jehovah. In 2 Kings chapter 2, God heals, or Rapha, the water when Elisha throws salt into the spring. See, the word has the idea of restoring something to its original state. 
Sometimes we are in need of healing in all three areas at the same time, just like David was in Psalm chapter 6, verses 2 and 3. First of all, there was the emotional healing. He cried out, Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak. God also addressed his physical needs, where David cried out, O Lord, heal me, for my bones are troubled. And God also touched David spiritually when David cried out, My soul also is greatly troubled, but how long, O Lord? How long? You know, at other times, one of these areas may seem to take precedence as the bitterness that comes from brokenness breaks through. And God reveals himself as Jehovah Rapha when we are in need of emotional healing. You know, Jehovah Rapha heals emotional hurts and broken hearts. In Psalm 147, verse 3, we read, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Now that word broken means to burst, to break into pieces, to crush and to smash. Some of you might feel that way right now. Your emotional pain is overwhelming. Folks, whatever pain you are carrying around, hand it to the healer today. Some of you have incredibly intense hurt that I can't even begin to relate to. Maybe it's something that happened when you were younger, or perhaps it just happened yesterday. And in the midst of your tears, cry out to Jehovah Rapha and ask him to put you back together again. Now related to this, relational ruptures can cause emotional pain. If you're struggling with a broken relationship, I encourage you to do what you can to make peace. As Romans chapter 12 verse 18 says, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. But God also provides physical healing. Some of you are experiencing an extremely difficult time right now as you're trying to process the pain and the discouragement that's coming from physical difficulties. Maybe it's personal pain, or maybe you're devastated by the news you've received about a family member or a friend. Whatever the case, when our bodies don't work right, we can end up feeling uptight. And at times like this, we need to ask Jehovah Rapha to do his healing work in our lives. You know, the Bible is filled with examples of God's healing touch. In 2 Kings chapter 20, we read that Hezekiah became very ill and was about to die. And as a result of intense intercession, he was healed and his life was even extended. Now, this is really an amazing account. This is what the Lord, the God of your father David, says. I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will heal you. I will add 15 years to your life. In the Gospels, we see that Jesus spent a surprising amount of time healing people. God also brings spiritual healing. This is by far the most important realm of the three types of healing. Jehovah Rapha sees that we are spiritually sick, and he provides healing and wholeness through the shed blood of Jesus on the cross. Our diagnosis is bad, and our prognosis is terminal. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 records the incurable condition of the human heart. He writes, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? See, we are sinners who have been inflicted with the disease of death and destruction, and we're in desperate need of a new heart. Early on in his ministry, 
Jesus got up in a synagogue one day and he quoted from the Old Testament book of Isaiah. And in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, we read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Once we are set free spiritually, God can break every other bondage that we are under, including addictions and deep-seated sin patterns. And while it's certainly true that Jesus healed a lot of people physically, he's always more interested in curing our sin problem. Do you remember what Jesus passed along to John the Baptist when he wanted to know if he was really the Messiah? Listen to these words out of Matthew chapter 11, verse 5. Jesus said, The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. See, evangelism, not physical healing, must always be the main point of our ministry as well. The pervasiveness of sin in our souls is pictured very vividly in Isaiah chapter 1. Verse 5 says, Why should you be stricken again? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faints. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed or bound up or soothed with ointment. See, that's a picture of what lives are before Jesus comes in and does his saving work. Verse 18 provides the good news showing the cleansing power of forgiveness. He says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. You know, when the Israelites were faced with three days of no water, Numbers 15 says that God tested them. Likewise, when we go through tough times emotionally, physically, and spiritually, we are really entering a testing time. There's at least eight principles to keep in mind that will help us pass the test and better understand the healing power of Jehovah Rapha. Here's principle number one. Trials and troubles can get us back on track. You know, I've talked to folks in the past who have told me that their difficulties led them to read the Bible and to get close to the Lord. I've had others who said that they had experienced an extremely difficult year, but it was actually a blessing because they fully surrendered to Christ as a result of their pain. And that's exactly what the psalmist tells us in Psalm 119. In verse 67, he says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. And a little later, he says, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. Beth Moore suggests that we all have empty places in our lives as a result of brokenness and dissatisfaction, and it's a secret abyss for many of us. When we're hurting, we must turn to Jehovah Rapha and resist the urge to fill our emptiness with things that will not satisfy. The second principle I want to share with us is sometimes our pain is related to personal sin. You know, when you're hurting physically or emotionally, it, it's good to do just a quick inventory to see if you have any unconfessed sin in your life. In Psalm 32, 
David links his physical pain, his emotional agony, to his personal sin. In verse 3, he says, When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. And the theme is continued for us in Psalm 38. In verse 3, he says, There is no soundness in my flesh because of your anger, nor any health in my bones because of my sin. And skipping on down to verse 17, For I am ready to fall, and my sorrow is continually before me. For I will declare my iniquity, I will be in anguish over my sin. Let me say it again. Personal sin may be a contributing factor to your illness, and therefore should be taken seriously. Which brings me to the third principle, not all illness is directly linked to personal sin. Now we can certainly say that all illness ultimately is a result of Adam and Eve's sin, but we need to be careful not to link every problem that we have to some sin in our lives. That was the mistake that Job's friends made when they kept accusing him of wrongdoing. See, in their minds, Job was suffering because somewhere, somehow, Job had sinned. Let's be careful here. Some of you beat yourself up mercilessly as you blame yourself for your own pain. Others of you need to back off and stop giving your perspective on why someone else is suffering. Jesus addressed this prevalent mindset when he was asked to explain why a certain man was born blind. His disciples wanted to know whether this man had sinned or his parents had sinned. And Jesus told them in John chapter 9 verse 3, neither this man or his parents sinned. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. I am convinced that most illness is a result of God wanting to do something different rather than some punishment that we think we might deserve. The fourth principle I want to share, it's okay to go to professionals, but go to the great physician first. Now, there are some folks who refuse to get any help because They want to trust God alone for their healing. And it's my understanding that God often works his healing through doctors, through other trained professionals, and through medicine. Remember that the bitter waters at Merah became better only when something was added to them. God could have made them sweet apart from any other means, but he chose to use the wood. Likewise, God can heal with just a word from his mouth, but he also uses other instruments as well. Now, having said that, what Asa did in the Old Testament is a warning to us. When he was sick, he didn't go to God first, but instead he ran right to his doctor. This is described for us in 2 Chronicles chapter 16. Though his disease was severe, even in his illness, he did not seek help from the Lord, but only from the physicians. Now, here's the point. Don't bypass the great physician on the way to the doctor's office. Here's principle number five. We need the community of faith. James chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, describes what we should do when we're sick. First of all, we're told to call for the elders of the church and ask for prayer. Secondly, confess your sins to others. And third, pray for one another. These steps are only possible if you're plugged into a community of faith. When you are hurting, you need the help of other folks. But sometimes those around us don't always know how to help. 
Listen to this story called Comforters. When I was diagnosed with a deadly disease, my first friend came and expressed shock by saying, I can't believe you're sick. I always thought you were so active and healthy. He left, and I felt alienated and somehow very different. My second friend came and brought me information about different treatments and gave me his opinion about what to do. He left, and I felt scared and confused. My third friend came and tried to answer my whys and told me God may be disciplining me for some sin in my life. She left, and I felt guilty. My fourth friend came and told me that if my faith was greater, God would heal me. He left, and I felt like my faith must be inadequate. My fifth friend came and told me to remember that all things work together for good. She left, and I felt angry. My sixth friend never came at all. I felt sad and alone. My seventh friend came and held my hand and said, I care. I'm here. I want to help you through this. She left. I felt loved, and I knew everything was going to be okay. Let me move on to the sixth principle I want to share. Faith is a force in healing. You know, some people mistakenly believe that if we just have enough faith, We can be healed of everything. And at the other end of the spectrum, others think that God doesn't even heal today, so they don't even bother to pray about their problems. Well, the proper biblical perspective is this. Pray earnestly for healing to Jehovah Rapha and have faith to believe that he can heal you. But be careful about demanding that he answer your prayers according to your will. We are to pray according to his will. Johnny Erickson Tata, who's in a wheelchair as a result of a diving accident, she adds these words, God certainly can and sometimes does heal people in a miraculous way today. But the Bible does not teach that he will always heal those who come to him in faith. He sovereignly reserves the right to heal or not heal as he sees fit. Tim Hansel writes, I have prayed hundreds if not thousands of times for the Lord to heal me, and he finally healed me of the need to be healed. Now having said that, We also need to keep the words of Mark chapter 6 in mind. This passage explains the importance of faith to Jesus. In verse 5 it says, He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. Faith somehow unleashes the healing power of God. James chapter 4 verse 2 says, You have not because you ask not. Be weary of folks who tell you the reason you aren't being healed is because you don't have enough faith. Just watch what happens the next time they stub their toe. Principle number seven. Sometimes healing takes place in unusual ways. Tony Campolo tells a story about being in a church where he was asked to pray for a man who had cancer. And he prayed boldly for the man's healing. And that next week, he got a telephone call from the man's wife. She said, you prayed for my husband. He had cancer. And Campolo thought when he heard her use the past tense that her his cancer had been eradicated. But then she said, He died. Well, Tony Campolo felt terrible, but she continued. She said, don't feel bad. When you saw him, he was filled with anger. He knew he was going to be dead in a short period of time, and he hated God. He was 58 years old. He wanted to see his children and grandchildren grow up. 
He was angry that this all-powerful God didn't take away his sickness and heal him. And he would lie in bed and curse God. And the more his anger grew towards God, the more miserable he was to everybody around him. And it was an awful thing just to be in his presence. But the lady told Campolo, he said, After you prayed for him, a peace had come over him, and a joy had come into him. And Tony, the last three days have been the best days of our lives. We've sung, we've laughed, we've read scripture, we prayed. Oh, they've been wonderful days. And I just called to thank you for laying your hands on him and praying for healing. And then she said something incredibly profound. She said, Tony, he wasn't cured, but he was healed. That brings me to principle number eight. The cross of Christ is the source of healing. The Jehovah who heals in the Old Testament is the Jesus who heals in the New. Don't miss the significance behind the wood from a tree providing sweetness to the bitter water. All of our problems began at a tree in the Garden of Eden, and our sin problem is resolved because of another piece of wood was used to hold up our sin substitute on the cross. In Isaiah 53, verse 5, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. First Peter chapter 2, verse 24, Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Only Jesus can sweeten the bitterness of life. Only Jesus is the bondage breaker, as Leviticus 26 verse 13 says. I have broken the bands of your yoke and made you walk upright. Maybe you've fallen recently and it feels like you've crashed so quickly you don't even know what happened. Whether you're hurting emotionally, physically, or spiritually, turn to Jehovah Rapha right now. Let's go back to Exodus 15 for just a moment. After God made the sour water sweet, he then led the Israelites to a place called Elam. And we read in verse 27 where Elam had 12 springs and 70 palm trees. God led them to a place of plenty. Even if we're not cured, We can be healed by Jesus. He is both the wood and the living water, as he said in John chapter 7, verse 37. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The only way to go from Mara to Elam is to turn to Jesus, who is our Jehovah Rapha. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you this morning. God, I thank you for everyone who has joined us here today. And Lord, I know that from the folks who are watching, folks who are listening to us, Lord, I know there must be someone who is in need of healing. Whether it is physical healing, whether it is emotional healing, Lord, it could be spiritual healing. Father, we're so thankful that Jesus is the source of all three healings. I pray today that you would send the healing that we need. Especially spiritual healing today. Lord, I pray that if someone watching me does not know you as Savior, that they would find Jesus and they would ask him into their hearts so they too 
can be healed spiritually. Father, we thank you and we praise you for what you're doing in our lives. We pray for encouragement. We pray for strength. We pray for wisdom. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for joining us this week. Next Sunday, we're going to continue this series on the names of God that we see in the Bible. Also, this coming Wednesday, we continue with our live online Bible study out of the book of Genesis. That's Wednesday mornings at 10.30 a.m. live on Facebook. Thanks again for joining us today. May God bless you as you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You are loved. We'll see you next time.